I'm Jim Garner. I'm the CEO of Allergenis. And we are going to talk tonight about the opportunity to invest in food allergy in general, but also in our company. I'm joined by Christy Consalvo. Christy heads up our marketing effort. She's also a food allergy mom, um, so has a lot of empathy and sympathy for other families that go through the food allergy journey. Um, So as far as an agenda goes, um, we we can have other introductions during the Q&A session. I want to talk about food allergy um, funding opportunities in general, and then uh, briefly talk about allergenists, but then also I want to make sure I answer your questions. Some of the stats that you may or may not be familiar with really make food allergy a very important topic. There's over 200 million people impacted globally, and the current market spend or the current market opportunity associated with all things food allergy is nearly $30 billion. That's a huge amount of people impacted and a significant amount of money spent dealing with an an indication like this. In the United States, you may have heard these figures before. It's now estimated to be more than 32 million people in America living with a food allergy, one in 10 adults and one in 13 children. One in 13 children equates to two kids in every classroom on average. And then on ER visits, you may have heard this before, there's over 200,000 ER visits in the United States annually. That's one about every two and a half minutes. And the ER visits are attributed to reactions to food ingested, almost always to food known to be an allergen. And so it's an accident, It's an accident, but it still ends up with the family uh, ending up in the ER room, in the ER. As well, uh, reactions can go bad. So about 2% of admin admits to the ER ends up in an ICU stay. Uh, so one of the things that a lot of people focus on is rescue medications, epinephrine. And we know that there are about 13 million epinephrine prescriptions annually in the United States, but that doesn't equal the number of diagnosis. Uh, not every adult is carrying an EpiPen and it's likely if you do the math, it's likely that not every child is carrying an EpiPen. And in fact, one EpiPen is not enough. You need two. Uh, one EpiPen lasts about 15 minutes. Um, you need two EpiPens because most people don't live within 15 minutes of an emergency room. So in terms of statistics, it's a significant issue to, to face. And we know from date from market insights and conversations and data that especially parents are emotionally impacted by the diagnosis of food allergy when their child um, is identified as somebody who may be allergic or is allergic. And the stress associated with caring for an individual with food allergy really drives anxiety to the point where people start to exclude themselves from normal activities. Parents um, stop taking their families to restaurants. Some parents stop going to restaurants themselves. I've heard stories about Uh, The only time parents eat without their kids is in a drive-through lane. They stay in the car. They don't even take the food back home because they're so afraid of cross-contamination. And it's true that that the mental and emotional impact is more on on the parents than it is on the actual child. And a lot of that has to do with some telling someone that they have to avoid something and they have to be quite vigilant about that avoidance. The mere fact of, of avoiding something has to raise your anxiety so that you have the wherewithal the, to be able to avoid something. Even crossing the street, your anxiety has to go up in a busy street or in a, crossing a highway. Your anxiety, anxiety has to go up so you, you can make sure you avoid being hit by a car. Same is true for avoiding something that might be detrimental to your child. And we also know in, in market data and talking to caregivers that there's a financial strain on families and individuals. It's the burden is almost all on the individual and the family. Commercial insurance doesn't pay for a lot of food allergy interventions. And at the same time, we've been told firsthand here at Allergenist that that families, caregivers want to do anything they can to get better information. And we know that families go to great financial lengths as well to get to get more information and even access Um, to treatments that are not covered by insurance. And I'm not talking about clinical trials. I'm talking about unregulated oral immunotherapy that's quite expensive in private clinics, as well as the SoCal Institute in Southern California, which is 
quite expensive to undergo therapy. And yet people travel from all over the world uh, to get better answers and, and seek out this care. On the right side of the screen, I've articulated here, it's more than individual and caregiver with, with uh, food allergy, the provider, the allergy community is also impacted by this. Allergists tell us all the time that half of their waiting room is full of people that aren't allergic and they're dealing with delabeling that individual. Uh, the other half of the room, the allergists can help and they, they want to administer therapy. We also know that employers are impacted by food allergies and it's from absenteeism, it's from the expense associated um, with, with, the claim, with the commercial insurance claims, but also we have heard firsthand that um, in particular mothers change employment or have to reduce their employment because they feel like they need to be at home closer to their kid, closer to their kids dealing with the food and the food allergy. We also know that the food industry is impacted. Food manufacturers have regulations that they have to comply with, but they also uh, have manufacturing processes that they have to closely monitor. So the food industry is also impacted by this growing dilemma. And it, you may not consider a uh, travel and hospitality industry to be impacted, but food allergy families choose airlines, food allergy families choose hotels that are accommodating or friendly um, to those with food allergies. So this impact is, is quite considerable. And at the same time, a lot has happened in the last six years. Our company was formed in 2017 when there were only three therapeutic companies focused on developing uh, therapies or treatments. Today, there's more than 35. And this advent of focus on food allergy is, is very good for individuals dealing with food allergy because they'll have choices, they'll have options of different kinds of therapies that they can go through from oral immun immunotherapy, which is available today to a patch, um, which is, uh, there's two patches in development. Um, sublingual immunotherapy is also a promising uh, therapeutic in development. And then biologics and monoclonal antibodies as well, all being developed which will afford options um, to individuals with food allergies. Part of the focus tonight is to talk about the investment opportunity. So I've highlighted some no notable companies and what they've raised. And this again is not just since 2017, but these raises for the most part are in the last three years. Aladapt, I'm topping the list. Aladapt is a multi-therapy, um, oral immunotherapy, multi-allergen, excuse me, oral immunotherapy. They've raised the most money so far, 220 million. Um, and you can see here, I've annotated the focus of the company next to the name of the company. So Bryn Pharma is next in line, raising 125 and ARS right behind them, both developing rescue medication or epinephrine that can be inhaled rather than uh, through an auto injector. Most of these companies are therapeutic focused. Um, and you can see one of the things that uh, strikes me about these investments is that it falls off pretty drastically um, once you get past Aravax there with 26 million. We've raised 20 million to date and, and these other diagnostic companies, uh, therapeutic companies and prevention companies have raised far less. The point of the slide is that in this huge indication, 200 million people globally impacted, we haven't seen enough investment come in to the space. We haven't seen enough institutional investors getting behind these pharmaceutical companies and therapeutic companies, as well as diagnostics, not just allergenists, but as well as these therapeutic companies. Far more emphasis needs to be paid to the investment opportunity. And the reason is because of the growing prevalence, more and more people are being diagnosed with food allergy. And it's not because of awareness, it's because the guidelines, while they have changed, are not being followed. So the LEAP study in 2015, a landmark study published in the New England Journal of Medicine, clearly demonstrated that early introduction to peanut abates peanut allergy later in life. The same holds true for introduction to milk and egg and tree nuts and shellfish and everything else the family eats. The pediatricians are supposed to be emphasizing at the three month and six month visit that early introduction is key to avoiding food allergies. The guidelines changed in 2019 and just last year, a survey was conducted of pediatricians where 
of those that answered the survey knew that the guidelines changed, 60% were able to admit that they knew what the new guidelines are, and 20% in the survey responded that they take the time during the three-month and six-month visits to stress early introduction. And anecdotally, I had a call um, this evening just before the webinar started with a mom in Rochester, Minnesota, with a two-year, two and a half year old boy and other children in the household. But two and a half years ago, two years ago at the office visits uh, with the pediatrician, she was not told about an early introduction. She brought it up to the pediatrician because she read about it. She, she read about it in one of the Facebook support groups and the pediatrician knew that the guidelines had changed but did not take the time to inform this mom. So we know that the growing prevalence of food allergy is gonna continue until it's widely known that early introduction is the way is the way to prevent food allergies. And on the previous slide, Ready Set Food is a company that has an early introduction food product to help introduce multiple proteins. But you don't have to buy a specialty food to do that. You can feed you can feed the, the toddler the food that the whole family eats. But Ready Set Food is a safe and easy way to introduce those proteins. But one reason to invest is because prevalence of food allergies is going to continue to grow. A reason to invest in our company is because of the lack of accuracy of blood tests, but also the thoroughness of the diagnosis that's achieved with the current tools. So our blood test is highly accurate, corresponding to oral food challenge, and we always report out reactivity threshold or dose threshold, or in, in another word to think about it, how much is safe to eat or how much should be avoided because of the risk of an allergic reaction. I'm not going to dwell too much on that because we'll come back to allergenists, but another reason to invest in food allergy in general is because of these innovative solutions in development. Food allergy families and individuals deserve choices. They also deserve not to be treated like everybody else. It's not a homogeneous uh, disease. It's heterogeneous. Every individual has a different disease. Every individual has different reactions to, thresh to these different thresholds. Every individual deserves the choice between a rigorous oral immunotherapy regimen or wearing a patch every day or a vaccine or an injectable like Dupixent. They, every individual deserves these choices. So investors ha have the opportunity and the luxury of being able to help develop these therapies so that patients have choice and those investments will be profitable because of the lucrative nature of, of the therapeutic field. And then with the market potential and prevalence, the focus of these drugs is just going to grow the pie. It won't shrink the pie. Uh, there's an old saying, all, all boats ra raise and rise in high tide. As the market continues to grow, then these, in these investment opportunities will continue to be more meaningful. And then finally, the social impact. So many people are impacted, and it's not just the sheer number, it's not the mortality, it, not the life-threatening nature of the disease, it's not just that. It's the fact that so many people are changing their diets and so many families are impacted. Families don't take vacations, they, they stop going to restaurants, they don't go to ice cream parlors, and the ability to change people's lives through investing in a novel therapeutic or a novel diagnostic is, has a true and meaningful social impact. I'm going to pause there and Christy ask if any questions have come up in the chat or in the q and I, I don't see any specific questions. I'll give people a chance to enter those in, but I did was wondering if you're going to expand on um, how Allogenis assists these therapeutic companies to bring their products to market. And if you could just expand a little bit on how the companion diagnostics is important. Um, for them to bring it to market and how we fit into that journey to for those therapeutics. Sure, um, I can jump right to that, Christy. So one of the things that our platform has proven out is that through the identification of immunodominant epitopes, we now understand what the trigger is for an IgE-mediated reaction to a food protein. That We've identified three in peanut. Uh, two are associated with the diagnostic test one is in common with a third that's associated with the reactivity threshold. And it's true in milk. We have identified three or, or four immunodominant peptides in milk that are responsible 
for an IgE-mediated reaction to milk protein. The reason it's important for clinical trials and therapeutic development is that we're able to phenotype patients for the first time. And phenotype is also another way to say stratify the patient population because it's heterogeneous, because not everybody has the same disease. And it's very similar in oncology and in breast cancer in particular, every woman has a different genetic profile, but those genetic profiles can be compared. And there's enough similarities where we know the outcomes of a breast cancer patient on a particular chemotherapy because we've been phenotyping breast cancer for so long. And we have such good outcomes measures associated with different targeted therapies. The same thing will happen in clinical trials in immunology geared towards food allergy treatments. We will be stratifying the patient population into different phenotypes, and then targeted therapeutics can be developed for that phenotype. And then similarly, we'll be able to identify patients as an example for palforzia that have severe adverse events we can identify patients that are so sensitive that they're likely not good candidates for a therapy. At the same time, from prognostic data that we've already seen in, in um, peanut milk and egg, we can identify patients that are likely not responders to the therapy. And that helps the clinical trial because if you're not gonna be a responder to the therapy, you shouldn't be in the clinical trial. Uh, it, it impacts the efficacy uh, endpoint so the clinical trial actually not will be more successful, more lucrative, but will identify the right kind of a patient for the therapy. And then from a recruitment standpoint, it'll take some time to achieve this. But today, to get into a food allergy clinical trial, you have to undergo an oral food challenge. And even more so, you have to react during that oral food challenge to get into the clinical trial. So for the, the risk associated with that many individuals and caregivers choose not to pursue enrollment into a clinical trial. And the reason that's important and how we can impact that is that our blood test being a surrogate for oral food challenge could eventually be the entry requirement for a clinical trial. Meaning if our blood test is positive, that's reason enough to be enrolled into the clinical trial. And then at the end of the clinical trial, if our blood test is negative, then likely the therapeutic endpoint was met, the patient can tolerate the food, and they can go ahead and do an exit oral food challenge, which makes sense because it's food, and we all want to get back to normal eating, to ad-lib eating that food. So that's a very long answer. Christy, did I, did I answer that um, thoroughly? You answered enough? it great. You answered it great. I was just going to comment that you know, for some therapies, such as the patch, it's very difficult for them to know if the if the patient is progressing through the, to the therapeutic endpoint. Um, so having a diagnostic that could kind of um, be a companion to that allows them to see if these patients are reading, reaching the therapeutic outcomes as they, as they progress through, through um, therapy. I don't know if you want to expand on that more, but sure. that's, they, uh, no, they're going to need good. that when they launch. They're, they're, ha they're have to know because they're not ingesting it on a regular basis. They won't necessarily know if they had an accident in ingestion, are they raising their tolerance without some sort of diagnostic to accompany that? You're right, Christy. And, and we work very closely with DBV. In the course of the phase three clinical trial, they had to do oral food challenges along the, the course of therapy to understand who was responding. And in clinic, once the, once the drug is at, once the patch is FDA approved and prescribed, parents and allergists aren't going to want to do an oral food challenge every three months just to see if the individual is responding. So we've already published data that our blood test could be that replacement so that you wear the patch every day, your three-year-old or your five-year-old is wearing the patch every day. Is it really worth it? Do I need to wear this patch for three years? Is my, is my little boy responding or is my little girl responding? And our blood test can signal back to the parent and the provider that, yeah, sure enough, you can see here the epitope levels are declining. They're decreasing, meaning that tolerance is being achieved. So that's exactly the, um, the idea of by using a biomarker, not just for, not just for Vioskin peanut, but for all of the therapeutics that are in development. And we also are anticipating working with the biologics like Dupixent um, and, and um, Zolaire, Dupamilumab and Omelizumab. We anticipate that biomarkers will be used there as well, 
because immunocap can't be used to monitor whether or not uh, dupixin is working. It blocks IgE. And so we're anticipating we will be an important biomarker for the biologics as well. For the monoclonal antibodies, th this slide depicts what we're looking at. So the epitope is the antigen that the monoclonal antibody would need to modulate. Today by Jim. several therapeutics uh, are, are important. Is it my, my internet unstable? I think you might've just dropped off just for a second there, but that ha you've been very, um, I have, that's the first time I heard a hiccup with your sound. Okay, let me switch real quick. And um, you started it so that our guests won't be kicked off. Let me switch real quick. And then for those that are on the call, please feel free to submit any questions you have in the Q&A or the chat. And I can um, present those present to Jim those to for, for an answer. Uh, Jim, looks like we have one question from, from Deborah. Is allogenous epitope testing or similar epitope testing currently being studied in the upcoming DBV trial or other trials? Uh, we are working with DBV in their MILK trial. Uh, we did a lot of data analysis um, for the prior trials, um, epitope, uh, papites. Um, we did not do the data uh, analysis for the one to three-year-old trial. It was excellent data though. We we're very excited for DBV about that. Uh, DBV is a, is a company that we work very closely with. Was there another question about the trial or was it, did I answer it? I think you answered it. We'll give Deborah a chance to, to respond there. Can you comment on some of the recent I'm not sure everybody on the call has seen the recent publication, not publications, but the recent data that was presented um, in July. And I think it's really interesting and extremely exciting for food allergy parents and individuals around the peanut severity. Can you talk a little bit about that and how that could impact um, the, the lives of these patients, but also um, potentially how allergists use therapy in office, oral immunotherapy in office? I anticipate you were going to ask about the DBV data. Um, you're asking about our data. Um, so, <laughs> so one of the it's not a holy grail because it's not it's not um, a holy grail. It's something that can't be solved. Uh, a biomarker that people have been seeking for years is the ability to have an easy and non-invasive way to understand who would be uh, who would be more likely to have anaphylaxis reaction rather than just a mild reaction. Mild meaning localized. It's still an allergic reaction, but it doesn't progress to the um, the potentially fatal reaction of anaphylaxis. Um, so people have been searching for a severity marker for years, um, and we have initial and very promising data that the the epitope that we call H008 is also a marker of severity. Meaning, when we see in the cohorts that we've evaluated. When we see a very high expression of 008, it does correlate to oral food, food challenge outcomes that resulted in anaphylaxis. And in the outcomes in oral food challenge confirmed reactions that are not anaphylaxis, the epitope expression is not nearly as high. Um, so what we, the early and promising data we have that still needs to go through more validation is that we would be able to stratify um, the the risk tolerance or the the threshold dose, we would be able to stratify those patients into those likely to progress to anaphylaxis if they react versus those that are unlikely to ever have an anaphylaxis reaction. They'll still react. They still need epi, but it's not likely to be to be life threatening. And Christy, I know you understand a lot about the data too. What would you add? Oh, I was just going to add that, you know, we've spoken with, with many allergists and around product development of bringing a test similar to this to market. And, you know, what we've been told is that many times there's not enough allergies doing oral food challenges. The wait time for many patients and individuals is six months or longer to get in to schedule an oral food challenge. And so the thought around some allergists is that maybe there'll be additional allergists that come on board to do oral food challenges that they can have this additional information, such as which patients are likely to have severe reactions. So we're hoping that this would help open the door for, for other patients to have access to oral food challenges, because um, it is really informative to the, the offices themselves around 
performing those and being uh, prepared, you know, especially for severe cases, if they should um, indicate that they're likely to have it's one of those severe reactions. And Chrissy, that's true for oral immunotherapy as well. So there is a risk. Mm-hmm. There is a risk of reacting to when, when you ingest the antigen that you're allergic to, there is a risk of a reaction. So being able to first identify threshold doses helps in the early dosing of palforgia, helps in the early dosing of homebrew, they call it. It helps identify somebody who should be on powder versus slit. But then exactly what you just articulated, Christy, the higher the dose goes, where does the where does the awareness around potential risk need to kick in? Everybody's at risk of a reaction, but if we're able to identify those that will not anaphylax, um, then it'll be a it'll be uh, a much more informed discussion about that course of therapy. And this is a, an example again of the heterogeneity of the disease. You can't look at somebody, and you can't look at their eyes to determine if they're allergic or not. You can't look at their blood tests, IgE, and determine if they're a low dose responder or a high dose responder. And you can't do an oral food challenge and uh, predict who's going to anaphylax and who's not. It's these objective biomarkers that have the ability to phenotype patients. The oral food challenge can't even uh, do the the phenotyping of a child who's going to outgrow an egg allergy or outgrow a milk allergy. You can't conduct an oral food challenge and understand that. But with our biomarkers, you can. We've already published um, the ability to predict outgrowth for both of those. So it's just another example of, of in clinical trials, how we'll be able to help stratify patients. So I think Deborah had another question. How far away is allogenous from verifying these thresholds? Uh, for the reactivity threshold, it's been validated. Um, we we uh, validated against six different clinical trial cohorts that were all OFC confirmed peanut allergic. Each of them um, had OFC, uh, very well characterized oral food challenge data, including the dose at where they reacted um, and what kind of reaction they had. So we've already verified, validated um, that our levels correspond to the output of the oral food challenges in those clinical trial cohorts. And Christy, you spent a lot of time in, in product development on that as well. What else would you add to that answer? I think you captured it. I don't know if I'd have anything to add with that. That was perfect. Deborah, is that what you meant? Did I answer the it question? Looks like she said, okay. She looks like she said, thank you. So I think so. Um, Jim, I think it would also be helpful to maybe expand a little bit. Um, actually, we just had one question. When will allergenists expend the number of allergens they are able to test? Do you want to talk a little bit about the products and pipeline and sure the estimated timing for that? Yeah, peanut um, is a, is clinically available. The, the next test that we will work on in peanut is uh, to monitor therapy. Um, right now, it's a research use assay. The next test in the peanut suite will be uh, to be able to monitor the therapies that are approved and available in that in the marketplace. Um, milk is shortly thereafter. We have made a tremendous progress on milk. Um, We've already completed much of the validation effort, the analytical and the laboratory validation, as well as the clinical correlation to oral food challenge. We have a few months left um, on the milk work. Egg is is very quickly behind that. And the more um, we validate epitope mapping, the faster we are at validating future products. Um, It'll be um, a market dynamic uh, to choose between wheat or sesame. The molecular characterization of the uh, wheat allergens and epitopes have already been completed. Uh, Mount Sinai and allergenists will begin work on sesame in January. And we've already identified a very large cohort of sesame, um, OFC confirmed sesame allergic patients. Um, so it'll be a market decision on whether or not it'll be peanut milk and egg and then it'll be a market-driven decision on wheat or sesame. Um, part of the market dynamics will be um, some of the issues that have come up with labeling on sesame, but also um, the complexity of wheat intolerance. And, and a food allergy is a food intolerance. It's at one end of the spectrum. Wheat is, is multifaceted in that you can be allergic to wheat. 
You can be not allergic to wheat, but insensitive. You can be gluten intolerant. You can also have celiac disease, and you can also have inf inflammatory bowel conditions associated with the ingestion of wheat, which are not an allergy, not a gluten intolerance, not celiac, but can lead to Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Um, so wheat is a very complex um, food, insensi food um, insensitivity, and some of the market dynamics around treatment options are going to drive drive our decision to go with wheat over sesame or vice versa, sesame over wheat. Um, it'll be it'll be increasingly difficult um, to validate other foods except soy. Soy will be uh, relatively straightforward. Tree nuts, there are many. Uh, and there are not large, well-characterized clinical trial cohorts of all of the tree nuts. So very small cohorts for almond, very small cohorts for cashew, hardly anything uh, for pine nuts. I don't, I've never seen a clinical trial for pistachio. Um, the same is true for shelf, uh, not shellfish, fin fish. It'll be very difficult to do a test for every kind of fish, cod, salmon, bass. Shellfish is different. Um, we are very close collaborators with the Baylor um, School of Medicine in Houston, Texas, and uh, Carla Davis, an investigator there, who already has a very large cohort for adults um, allergic to shrimp. Um, so uh, we're, we're in close communications with Carla around her readiness to move forward with validating a, a blood test. It'll, it'll mainly be for adults, uh, but for shrimp allergy. And Deborah just commented sesame would be great. It seems like the wild card of food allergy. Yeah, yeah so it's a hot topic, because, especially now. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. of what happened with labeling. Yeah, it's very unfortunate that 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 loophole was in there in the regulations as well as discovered. I also should comment on um, the the market dynamics and the difficulty in um, validating and coming out with tests rapidly. There's, a hunt, oh, there's about 160 foods identified that can cause allergic reactions. 95% of the pediatric reactions are peanut, milk, egg, tree nuts, and sesame. And so if we have those allergens covered, we've got almost every pediatric reaction covered. And it's more so uh, difficult in adults, especially because of finfish and uh, and shellfish and late onset adult allergies. Uh, Thermo Fisher has been working since the early 80s and there's, they just validated the sesame test um, four or five years ago, or maybe even, maybe even uh, not that long ago, three or four, three years ago, maybe they validated the sesame test. So um, we strive to hit the major allergens, but it'll, it'll take us a bit of effort and a bit of time to, to cover all of the allergens. People, just another second for any additional questions. I might just add one comment to that, Jim, is that, uh, you know, I know you talked about how that we've been able to speed up the, the product development process as we as we progress. And I think one of the, the key reasons for that is that we've established very good collaborations and strong collaborations with a lot of different universities and research centers around the world. So some of the samples that we're testing are, uh, they're all over, I mean, Australia, uh, Europe, um, so we've really have this great network and milk, I'd have to say was, it was fairly easy for us to obtain the samples there. We've already got allergists reaching out to provide us egg samples and other samples as well, uh, for other allergens. So this definitely is getting easier. I'd say that's one of the most challenging parts of the process is obtaining those samples. And as we've established this very collaborative network of of allergists and research centers to collect samples has been extremely helpful in expediting the product development process. One of the things that I realized, um, Christy and I are very close to this. So one of the things I realized that we leave out very often is that we have very rigorous validation standards. Um, we follow the National Academy, National Academy of Medicine's guidelines for validating complex diagnostics, which means our blood test correlates to a clinical reaction and the clinical reaction is a double-blind placebo-controlled oral food challenge. We have not uh, developed a test and, and don't have plans to develop a test without being able to verify our results compared to an oral food challenge result. 
because that's what the clinician and the individual are counting on. They're, they're counting on the positive predicted value of the test. If the test is positive, I'm allergic to the food. They're also counting on the negative predictive value. If the test is negative, I'm not allergic to the food. And the gold standard for establishing that is not a blood test. It's not a skin prick test. It's the oral food challenge. It's ingesting the food. So our blood tests, peanut, milk, egg, wheat, sesame, um, and shrimp will all be validated with clinical trial cohorts that have enabled us to test blood from people who reacted during an oral food challenge. And we'll know what dose um, they were able to tolerate safely, how much is safe to eat. We'll know how much triggered the, the reaction and we'll know what their reaction is. And the rigor to which we validate these blood tests is why people have so much confidence in our results, but it's also why it'll be, it'll be difficult for us to do something like coconut because there's not gonna be a, a large clinical trial cohort of OFC confirmed coconut reactions. That's right. I, and I, as far as there's existing samples available, but we do have allergists that reach out that are actively have projects going on for random allergens that say, I would like to include this as part of my, my study on coconut. So, um, you know, it might be a, a future trial that we would work with these different centers to establish those samples so that we could use them. That's right. Yeah. As long as it meets, as long as it meets our standards for mm -hmm. The quality data. We work with uh, uh, researchers and, and experts at Stanford, at Mount Sinai, at Johns Hopkins, at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden, the King's College in London, Murdoch in Australia. We work with the, the leading researchers um, globally so that we, we are confident in the data they're sharing with us. Uh, but you're right, Chris, you've, allergists have um, one-off studies that they, they want to collaborate with this all the time. And it's because of the rigor we follow, but also our association with Mount Sinai. I think that's it for questions. Is there anything else you'd like to expand upon, Jim, before we close the, the call here? No, I want to thank everybody for your interest. Thanks for joining tonight. We, we are raising money. Uh, a company like ours is capital intensive. We want to continue to the follow the science. We want to continue to develop these assays. It, it's capital intensive. It takes a lot of money. Um, our, our expertise and our staff are dedicated to this. Um, we, we do have a, a regulation CF funding opportunity open on StartEngine. Um, folks are able to go to startengine.com and search for Allergenis in the, in the search bar there. We'd welcome any level of, of investment um, through this through this uh, fundraising effort we have going on. So I, I will close with that, Christy. All right. I think Deborah has one question if you want to take a look in the Q&A. Um, Jim, okay. I don't know if you want to answer that now or we can answer it on the side here. I know we are um, about 40 minutes into the call here, so we may need to close out. Uh, it's a Deborah, question on are you, the- Deborah, are you an allergist? Can you unmute her? Yeah, let me see if I can do that. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Oh, I sure can. Yes, we can hear you. Super, yes, I'm, a, I'm an allergist um, at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. So we're involved in some of these studies and I've, been, I've, I've actually had some patients ask me about the allergenist testing. And of course it's not covered yet by insurance. So, um, when I see these levels, level one, two, and three, and I see the group in the level three, which would be very, really reassuring to a lot of parents, they may even choose not to partake in OIT unless some of your data regarding responders and stuff like that is helpful. <clears throat> so one of the thoughts I had was if someone's in that 85%, I'm sorry, and it's a, I guess tolerate half of a peanut and 73% could eat one and a half. Um, Instead of doing a full food challenge, which, um, you know, if we did a small low toast threshold challenge, um, would that definitively answer the question for these parents who want a hundred percent guarantee with the understanding, I always tell them that their thresholds vary based on the health of the child that day. And if they're right. sick, they let the thresholds drop. Yep. <clears throat> but this is, 
this came up when the parent went, um, went through the testing and she paid for it out of pocket. And she said, well, I'm glad I did it, but I'm not sure I'm any in any different place than I was before. And, and I believe she came back to level three. And so I said, if you wanted to know for sure, black or white, we could do a low dose challenge. And if she passes that, that should make us feel pretty good about traces. And that actually gets her where most of the studies like AR101 and DBV get the kids ah. to tolerate 300 milligrams. 300. Of That's right. That's right. That's right. And Deborah, anecdotally, I can tell you, I've had allergists and uh, parents not only ask the same question, but go through what they were able to, to do. So one parent came back as level three and the 17 year old is eating four peanuts safely every day. So they didn't go, they didn't go for OIT. They, the dad is an EMT and he, he's very comfortable with administrating epi if there's a reaction, but the, the 17 year old is eating four a day. Um, another individual came back level three, they decided to do the threshold challenge. She ate peanut eight, she ate eight peanuts before she reacted. But she made it all the way to eight peanuts, which That's is incredible. Yeah. Um, At a le level two, which isn't as encouraging with that low 44 milligram threshold. You know, like you would, that would make me want to avoid challenging her. Is she on OIT or they just outright challenged her? Uh, th they were both level threes. If I said level two, I was, it was. Oh, a I apologize. Place. They were I both level threes. Okay. Thank you. I apologize. I might not have listened close. Um, I think it was Jackie Ross with Allergy Partners in New Jersey talked about how she would encourage others to think about level one, level two, level three. So a level one patient in terms of therapy, that seems like a candidate for SLIT. A level two could be SLIT or OIT, but do a challenge, do a low dose challenge to see where you would start dosing. And then level three, as you pointed out, likely not a candidate for palforzia. And if the parents want to go through the rigor of OIT, it could be level three could be a candidate for OIT. But she went on to say it's also about the family's risk tolerance. And I'll, I'll just switch to my own perspective here. I live in South Florida. And three years ago, masks disappeared. The very, very high risk tolerance in South Florida. I'm in Cape May, New Jersey um, this week. And there are people still wearing masks here. So very low risk tolerance. And it, I, that's obviously regionally, but it's also by individual. So the, the, Deborah, the person who asked you or brought in this level three and said, I'm still in the same place, doesn't have the same risk tolerance that my wife would have with our kids. If my wife saw at 44 milligrams, over 90% tolerate 94 milligrams or 40, 44 milligrams, my wife would say, let's go for it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there, I just ha happen to have a lot of very afraid parents, you know, and they, um, they really struggle with these concepts, which, you know, I, I think, I think there was one study and forgive me, I can't remember which one it was that, um, it might've been the PAT study or something, but it seemed like 85% of children could tolerate foods with traces. I, I'm don't quote me on that. Of course, I'm sure you probably have better statistics, but they just are even afraid of the traces. And so um, I think this could be very helpful. And I appreciate your talk tonight uh, very much. And I think it's very exciting. We do need better studies. Nobody even wants to do food challenges. Our food challenge waiting list is close to a year long at this point. And um, we do them all the time. And we're just trying to figure out how to get more rooms and providers mm -hmm. to help, help us do them. So um, I think it sounds like a great product. and. Um, I think further guidance, I, maybe I'll try to find the um, allergy partners doc. If she gave a talk, would it be archived? Yep. Jack, uh, Jackie's webinar was recorded, right? Christy? It, it was recorded and it's actually on the homepage of our website. Okay, so great. You can, you can get to that link yep. through there. Yeah. Thank you. I'll watch it. I apologize. They haven't seen it already. Deborah, um, you mentioned the studies revolving around um, reactions to less than four milligrams of peanut. And it, it, it won't be lost on you on level one, two, and three, it's above 90% tolerate less than four milligrams of peanut. So our levels, those correspond to the six cohorts that we used OFC confirmed, but our levels also correspond to all of the clinical trial data around trace reactions. 
and I, I don't remember the acronym in Australia. Um, they're on 2.0 around uh, labeling and understanding different levels and tolerances. And their data also suggests that it's less than 5% of patients respond, react to less than four milligrams of peanut protein. Yeah, so it's it's a very small amount. At the same time, I think sometimes the traces are going to be higher in, in like Chinese food example, where it's actually not a trace, it's an intentional ingredient and parents are eating out. I think there's some higher risk scenarios that would truly involve more than a trace versus let's say an M&M peanut or a or an M&M regular plain M&M or a um, chocolate bar from Hershey's that might have a trace. I, and I think that that's the tough part is yeah. they're looking for bite proof. Um, a trace is helpful. Trace is hugely helpful. And I think that this is really helpful for that. Um, but then the next question is, do we need, do we need to do interventional therapy? Um, and I'm just really looking forward to the future publications you guys have when you put the data together. Are, did you by chance mention ge genetic testing or DNA methylation testing at all? Or is it mostly just epitope testing at this point? It's, it's proteomic. It's just the epitopes. Okay. Okay. So, thank yeah. you. Okay. Thank you. I've taken enough of your time. I apologize. No, no, thank for you for the questions. Thanks for just participating for sure. Okay. Um, Chrissy, do we have children set up as an account? Because I know we've interacted with others from children's. Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. So Deborah, you, you're, I don't know if your lab has agreed to send out, but we already have everything. On, we already have children set up um, and onboarded. That's great. Do you know the approximate out-of-pocket cost if it's not covered by insurance? It's $725 for the allergic status test, the, the first test. And if allergic, and we report out the uh, dose uh, threshold, then it's another 725. We have CPT codes assigned for each assay and we're priced on the clinical lab fee schedule. The pricing is 463 for the first test and 459 for the second test. We don't have contracts with payers. So the first step a payer does is look to see if we're listed on the clinical lab fee schedule. And very often they'll pay that rate and we accept, we accept the CMS pricing. Okay, great. Do you by chance um, see a good bit of insurances covering this testing or is we there? Have, we don't have enough experience yet um, to be able to say that definitively. So okay. at this point, it's all over the map. And I'll, I'll tell you from my experience in diagnostics, we could submit two claims to uh, Independence Blue Cross Blue Shield on the same day and get two different answers. Yes, I, I'm very familiar with that. I understand completely. The other aspect of adjudicating a claim is not only is it the the administ the person who picks up the claim that day, but it's also the employer's benefit design. So some employers have great lab benefits. Some employers have terrible lab benefits with yes. the same, with the same payer. Yeah, it, it, I guess that you're right. Some of them, um, it's. I, it's not part of their deductible perhaps, or it is part of their deductible and they have to pay out of pocket till they reach a certain threshold, I'm afraid. Um, so I think it's fair to say if a family wants to do this, we'll say we'll submit it through your insurance, but there's a chance you may be charged $900, about $900 if it's not covered. Well, and I, I have a long history in oncology. So I, I, my attitude is that we'll do anything it takes to help the family first get the results and, okay. then, figure out, and then figure out how to pay for it. Okay, great. So we have Thank financial you. we have financial aid available. We agree to installment plans. We take HSA, FSA. Great. I I was in the military. I have a policy. We don't bill active duty families. Oh, good to know. I was in the military too. So whatever it takes for the family first to get the test and then to pay for it. Okay, great. All right. Well, I sure appreciate your time again. I know I'm taking too much of it, but you've answered oh, a lot of questions for me. You're not taking too much at all. Okay. Yeah. Well, we, a lot of people ask about it and I, um, I'm just, uh, I, I'm excited to see that it's, um, yeah, it's, there's so much, you know, work still being done towards it and towards other testing too. So thank well, you. we're very excited about the milk assays, uh, the mm -hmm. ability for you to look at the blood test result, because we can predict baked allergic or baked tolerant. Yeah. And to look at the blood test to say you're baked allergic, we don't have to do an oral food challenge. 
it, and I agree, uh, you know, milk for some reason with, with, the with some of the outcomes that have happened and they're rare, but milk OIT sounds like it's the toughest one to do. And, um, and also milk challenges sometimes can have terrible outcomes and granted all of them can, but yeah. um, there's these case reports that I think make uh, yeah. a lot of people steer away from milk. We, um, um, I don't, Chris, Chris, you're going to have to help me pronounce Anna's last name, but we had, we had two uh, abstracts presented at a Yaki this June on our early data for milk. Um, Anna Nowak, did I say it correctly? At, yes, I think so. Uh, the first abstract, the first data was around um, uh, determining uh, phenotype, baked, allergic, baked tolerant. And then the second data set was around uh, identifying those that only reach desensitization after OIT versus the group of patients that, re that attain sustained unresponsiveness. So the epitope signature is different in those two groups of patients. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, I, I'll have to go look for those because I, I didn't attend that conference. But uh, that you have is... your email address. I can send them to you. Okay, great. Yep, I can put that in the um, in the uh, chat here or the Q and A. Um, uh, I signed up with with my personal email address. Actually, I guess you could use that one. Whatever you um, prefer. We'll do whatever yeah, you prefer. That would be fine. I'll see it. Um, uh, well, you know what, I, maybe I would prefer it might go to the junk because every, there's so much junk on that one. Um, I'm going to put my, um, my work email in here. I'm glad Gwen stayed on. Um, Gwen, can, can you tell us a little bit about your story? I, the reason I ask is because it's fantastic. I have an allergist on a call like this. Maybe, maybe we didn't figure out Gwen's volume. And Tom just joined as well. Or is Tom on? Has Tom been on for a while? Chrissy, you're on mute. <coughs> Tom has been on. I just gave him the capability to ask questions live okay, if he'd like to. Yeah, this time I uh, I saw you a couple of years ago and checking in to see the progress and also seen and been tracking a number of the therapeutics companies as well. So glad to see this all moving forward. Tom, you said you saw us a couple of years ago. Where's that? On a webinar or someplace else? Um, that was a biotech showcase at JP Morgan Week. Oh, fantastic. 20, 2021, I guess it was, two and a half years ago. Well, I, I was definitely there in person in 20 before the shutdown. And I was there in 19. I was remote. It was 2020, okay. <laughs> I was remote in 21. Uh, and then I went back 22 and 23. Very good. Well, thank you for following us. Tom, did you have any questions? Um, not really. This is just, uh, just impressive uh, progress. So I will keep an eye, uh, eye on how you continue to evolve and keep bringing out the, the additional tests. We'll do it. We aim to, definitely. Thank you. Right. Anything else to wrap up, Jim? Or are you? I think, I, I think that's here. great. Thank you, everybody, for participating tonight. Yes. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Have a good night. Night. Thank you.